When I say the word energy, what does that bring to mind? What do you think of? I, because I'm an engineer, I think about how we produce energy. I think about fossil fuels. I think about solar energy. I think actually, I think about climate change and how our energy behavior is influencing the greenhouse effect. But there's a much more positive way to think about energy. Uh, when you think about energy as the basis for life, it's the basis of food. Uh, how do we turn our water into clean water? It's with energy. Uh, how do we power our health our healthcare system, our, especially our advanced technologies for health? It's with energy. Energy is a huge business, and energy enables both the basics of life, like transportation, and the luxuries of life, like some of our transportation forms. Now, with it being such a powerful basis of life and society, it's not surprising that we should be thinking about how our demand for it is going to be growing. And this plot really illustrates the potential for huge growth in our needs, our consumption for energy. I'm going to call the horizontal axis the affluence axis. It's GDP per capita. And I'm going to call the vertical axis the energy axis. It's energy per capita. Now look on the top right, you'll see the affluent nations of the world. Obviously we're consuming places like the US and Western Europe and Australia, we're consuming a lot of energy per citizen. But look closer to the origin, look on the bottom left of this graph and you'll see China, India and Brazil. And you'll see that today their GDP per capita is relatively low and you'll also see correspondingly their energy uptake per capita is relatively low. Uh, but are these nations with small populations? I mean, these are our billion-person nations. Uh, are they going to be growing along the horizontal axis? Are they experiencing this huge economic growth in the developing nations such as these? Of course they are. And in view of this correlation, they're going to be experiencing huge energy demand growth as well. What's that going to do? Well, it puts us in a position of an energy deficit. I mean, if you're worried about our current habits for energy consumption and fossil fuel consumption and carbon dioxide emission, well, just think about what's going to happen. There's going to be a doubling in our energy demand over the coming couple of decades, as shown in this plot. On the left is shown what we do today. About 80% of our energy needs are fulfilled using fossil fuels. But when we double, what's going to fill up this question mark? Are we going to just burn more fossil fuels? Well, I have good news. That probably didn't sound like it yet. But I have some good news. This problem of meeting our energy needs sustainably and cleanly, this is actually a solved problem. This has been done before. Not by people, not by engineers or scientists such as myself, but it's done by nature. So that huge 15 terawatts of power consumption uh, that I was talking about, all of a sudden I'm going to squeeze it down on this plot and show that level of global energy consumption of 15 terawatts and I'm going to compare it on the right with what photosynthesis does. So nature is already fulfilling a tenfold larger energy need through photosynthesis. What's it doing at a most basic level? It's taking the sun's energy, it's converting it into stored biomass, which is stored fuel. And in the course of it, it's eating up, it's consuming and sequestering carbon dioxide. So if it's a solved problem, is it something that we could learn about? Is it something that people who work on new solar cell technologies, where we're trying to make them efficient, but we're also trying to make them cheap. We're trying to put solar technologies everywhere to open our arms wide to catch the sun's rays. Is it something where we can learn from what nature has already solved? And that's the question that our CIFAR Emerging Program proposes to look at. And in particular, we think there are, there are specific ideas from nature that we can learn from. And it's these ideas that we want to tackle. And I'm going to illustrate three of them. The first one is that nature has figured out how to carry out energy transport within the photosynthetic apparatus with remarkable ease and efficiency. And we have hints of how. And these hints tell us that this cannot be explained purely using classical physics. Newton's laws don't allow us to understand fully how light gets absorbed and excitons, which are excitations coming from the sun, 
transferred into plants in the form of excited electrons, how they migrate. We need the rules of quantum mechanics. We need this fascinating duality, these ideas of wave functions and Schrodinger's uncertainty principle. We need these ideas of coherence to understand how nature achieves its remarkably efficient transport of energy. We don't fully understand it how, we just know that it's needed. And a new field has emerged called quantum biology to try to study this and understand it deeply. We also know that nature has found ways to make incredibly efficient use of this broad rainbow that is the sun's energy. Uh, so if you think of a bunch of algae uh, that uh, stratify, they form spontaneously as a community in a pond, well, they will sequester, and the ones on top will reach out and capture the blue and the ultraviolet part of the sun's spectrum, and the ones in the middle will do the green, and then the ones further down will do the red, and then there will even be infrared ones at the bottom of the pond. And so nature has figured out ways to take full advantage, almost to prism out, to splay out the sun's spectrum and to make fully efficient use of it. There's another remarkable inspiration in nature, and it's so far from what engineers do today when we think of building solar cells. Nature employs self-repair. If one of the proteins that's inside a plant's photosynthetic apparatus, if it gets damaged, maybe an overly energetic photon impinges on it, uh, or it gets a little bit too hot, well, rather than give up, it will repair it. It will transport it away to another region and actually use a little bit of solar energy to repair that protein. Now, this is just entirely counter to the way today's engineers think about making solar technologies. We think about making something that has to be so perfect, so pure, that it will last without change, without alteration, for 25 years. It's a completely different paradigm. What if we could change the way we think and think instead about building self-repair into our solar cells, into the means by which we generate solar fuels. So I and my colleagues scoured the world in order to find the leading people around the globe who think about these problems, but these problems in all of their dimensions. We sought to bring together a community that would include biologists and photobiologists and quantum biologists, that would include people who build new materials, materials chemists, people who think about how to make a device work well, and people who would engineer these into practical solutions. And we sought to bring them together because we thought that only by bringing this group together could we address this incredibly important problem in an innovative way, really take us off the path, off the course that has so far been charted by this community. And we would seek to create a pipeline of ideas, going from basic science, from, from new concepts, really speaking across different languages of science and engineering that that community speaks today, and transform these new ideas from science into practical new solar electricity technologies and means of directly taking light from the sun and turning it into fuels, solar fuels. And that we would have a further component of actually transforming these into technologies in the context of our emerging CIFAR program. We also recognize that this is not something that we can do on our own. This is not a purely academic problem. There are people from industry, from companies large and small, who have been working on relatives of this problem for decades, and that we have a lot to learn from them. And so a key dimension to our CIFAR program will be engaging with stakeholders, especially from the sustainable energy industry and from the energy sector broadly, in order to bring solutions to these problems. You know, this is a global challenge, obviously climate change, uh, energy. Um, but I'm actually really passionate about the Canadian dimension here. I and my colleagues have a dream that Canada could be the locus of innovation, of the creation of a new sustainable energy economy based on incredibly innovative bio-inspired technologies. You know that in a couple of years, the energy sector is going to be a 10 trillion dollar industry. So there's a huge societal opportunity, uh, there's a huge economic opportunity as well from learning from nature. And that's the challenge that we're about to embark on. Thank you. <laughs>